Thank you, Pastor. I, it's been a while since I've preached here, and um, I'm always humbled just walking up these stairs. Um, actually, I, I really don't walk up here um, any other time because I feel it's um, such a humbling experience to come and present the word to you. Um, but those that are able, go ahead and stand. We're coming out of the book of Mark, starting at chapter 4. I know that we had it to 10 and 12 was going to be skipped, but we're going to go ahead and add those. So it will be from 1 to chap from verse verse 1 all the way to chapter verse 20, and I'm coming out of the New American Standard Bible, um, but it's all God's Word. And he began to teach again by the sea, and such a very large crowd had gathered to him that he got into a boat in the sea and sat down, and the whole crowd was by the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables, and was saying to them in his teachings, Listen to this, behold, the sower went out to sow, and as he was sowing, some seed fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seeds fell on the rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprung up, because it had no depth of soil. And after the sun had risen, it was scorched. And because it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it and yielded no crop. Other seeds fell onto good soil, and they grew up and increased and yielded a crop and produced thirty, sixty, a hundredfold. And he was saying, he who has ears, let him hear. So soon as he was alone, his followers, along with the twelve, began asking him about the parables. And he was saying to them, you have, To you, you have been given the mystery of the kingdom of God, but those who are outside getting everything in parables. Verse 12, So while seeing, they may not, may see and not perceive, and while hearing they may hear and not understand, otherwise they might return and be forgiven. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word, and the ones that are beside the road where the, where the word was sown and where they heard, immediately Satan comes and takes away the word, and which has been sown in them. And in a similar way, the, the, these are the ones that, to whom the seed was sown on the rocky places, who then they heard the word, immediately received it with joy. And they have no firm root in themselves, but only temporary, then... The afflictions and persecutions arise because of the word. Immediately they fell away, and the others, and others are the ones that on whom the seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word, but the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires in other things enter in and choke out the word. And, the, and it becomes unfruitful. And those that are the ones on whom the seed has sown on good soil, and they heard the word and accepted it, bearing fruit thirty, sixty, a hundredfold. The word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. Dear Lord, as we come to this bit of scripture, having our worship team sing praises to you, 
And as a congregation, we sang praises too. As the soil was prepared by taking of the elements, allow this time be of you. Allow me to decrease, as John the Baptist said, I must decrease while he increases. Let me do the same. Let us hear only from you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So as we look at this parable, let us start to notice that this parable was one of five, of only five parables that were found in all three of the synoptic gospels. Each one of these gospels were written in diff by different authors and at different times and different audiences, for different audiences. The other four parables that were seen across all the synoptic gospels is the lamb, uh, the lamp under the basket, new cloth on old garments, and new wine in old wineskins, and a mustard seed. Now, out of all the parables presented by Jesus, it is only in this one where he, Jesus says, do you not understand this parable? How will you understand all the parables? Thus, we must understand that this parable has particular significance in the, the parable teachings. Now, we know that the de definition the dictionary gives us for parables are earthly stories with a heavenly meaning, which sounds good, but leaves a lot to question. Of course, the concept of teaching in parables, we know, was nothing new Jesus was using for the first time. One only needs to look back into the Old Testament and see that the use of parables as one form of teaching throughout Examples can be found in Ezekiel 17, 2 through 10, and in Isaiah 5, 1 through 7. Thus, one may question why Jesus is starting to use this teaching method at this point, where prior to, he used, he used teaching with graphic analogies. Examples can be seen in Matthew 5, where he says, you are the salt of the earth, or you are the light of the world. However, from this point forward, whenever Jesus was speaking to large groups, his teachings were done in the form of parables. As we look at, then at it, the overall context of Jesus' ministry at this point, larger and larger crowds were occurring, were coming to him, miracles were happening, happening as well. In fact, there were recorded 13 miracles performed prior to this parable even being taught. Thus, one could say his ministry was growing in leaps and bounds, which if one looks at how to grow a church, it seems that Jesus was off to a flying start. His, his disciples very well may have been around the campfire at night saying such things as, did you see how many people came today? I think it was bigger than the one from the last time. I think this um, thing's really starting to take off here. So let us remind ourselves, however, that it had been some 400 years since the last prophetic teachings had occurred, done by Malachi, Zechariah, and Nehemiah. In those 400 years, people of Israel had been looking for a king, a son of David, to whom his to reclaim his throne, kick out the Romans, and establish a kingdom forevermore. Now they might have remembered there were lots of fuss going on around Jesus' birth. There was a thing about strange lights in the sky, men from different far off lands, and shepherds coming in telling, from the fields telling amazing stories. But there was also a second birth, also around the same time as Jesus's which also had some strange happenings around it. That child became John the Baptist. They may have also been asking questions concerning the two births, as saying, well, wasn't John's mom Elizabeth, and wasn't Elizabeth some relation to Mary, the son of Jesus? However, that occurred now 30 decades ago, 30 years from what was going on now. 
there were, had been hearing about John the Baptist. He'd been out there in the Jordan Desert wearing strange clothes, even eating a more strange diet, honey and locusts. Now, as a bee farmer, as a beekeeper, I always say honey is great for everyone, except for our little ones over there, um, until they turn one, then all the honey they can have. Um, even more so, people were t even so, people were going out, trekking out to the desert to hear John speak. And they heard, what they heard from them shocked them. It was a simple and direct saying that J John was saying, the time is coming, repent, and be baptized. And he wasn't holding back either from what he was saying. He was even calling out the religious elite at the time that were also sort of coming along. They were, and he called them out saying, so why are you coming? Are you prepared to repent and be baptized as well? Thus, when Jesus himself came to John the Baptist, what did John say? Behold, the Lamb of God. John continued saying, I can't even untie the laces of Jesus' sandals, let alone baptize this man. However, John did just that, nevertheless, on Jesus' directions. Why? Because Jesus told him that's what needed to be done to fulfill the prophecies. Following his baptism, he went on to the local synagogue and read out of the book of Isaiah 4, 18 and following. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he sent me to proclaim the release of the captives and recover the sight of the blind and set free those who are oppressed to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Verse 21, and he began to say to, to them, today the scripture has been filled in, fulfilled in your hearing. Now, of course, those who were listening to this had heard this scripture taught many times. But what was, was remarkable was this final declaration. This they had never heard. Notice, however, right after Jesus is saying this, people were beginning to mutter to themselves, is this not Joseph's son? Sure, Joseph was a nice guy and all, and he was a fairly good carpenter in town. And he even had a few strong sons that were taking over the business after John had passed away. But he was no rabbi. And only the Pharisees and the Sadducees were the ones that could teach correctly from the Torah, they all thought. Another might have said, remember Joseph's first son, though? And all that crazy thing around his birth. And was not Joseph in some sort of way in the line of David? Thus, it would be no surprise that these people started to view Jesus in a slowly different light. However, in 400 years of storytelling by rabbis and mothers as they tucked their children into bed, the stories of a Messiah coming would have been added to, glorified, and exaggerated, just like any good fish, fishing story your grandfather may have told from, from now and then. Remember, They'd been waiting for a, somebody to come and reclaim the King, King David's throne with power and might and with a great army to kick out the Romans, thus breaking the, bonds of, the chains of bondage. Then establishing a new kingdom which would last forevermore. What they were looking for was a political revolution to begin, led by someone powerful, Maybe somebody like Samson um, in the book of Judges, where it says he, referring to Samson, found a fresh jawbone of a donkey and so reached out and took it and killed a thousand men with it. Instead, here they were coming to see a humble man sitting in a boat, telling them, of, telling them to sit down as they told him a story about a sower and sowing seed here, there, and everywhere. Now talk about the obvious. No wonder then that Jesus starts teaching in parables, the disciples began to question him. Jesus asked them 
about talking about planting seeds. And what was this thing about he who has ears, let them hear? Jesus, they might have said. You know everyone has ears, except, you know, old man Johnson, who lost his ear in a bar fight as a kid. We might have had, said instead, now, come on, Jesus, the people really seem to like it when you do those miracle things and the healings. Jesus, did you know we had 25 people on crutches who thought you were going to heal them and another 30 or so that, want, that were blind? Now, the thing you do with that raising of the dead, now that really gets them going. Keep, keep doing those things. Put on a really good show. They really enjoy that stuff. However, and when we, we look closer at this parable, this parable opens as Jesus is walking along the Sea of Galilee. Historians believe that it was at the cove of the parables, which is on the northern side shore of Galilee, where some of these teachings might have occurred. This cove is horseshoe shaped and as a result has an amazing natural acoustics and enough room and space for 5,000 to 7,000 people along the beach and even more along the hillsides as the cove is made. With Jesus, of course, moving offshore in a boat, floating pulpit, as you, were, as you could say, more people could have heard because we know that sound carries well across water. He begins with a simple everyday activity that all would have understood. A sower went out to sow some seeds. If you, any of you who are gardeners, you know that spring is just around the corner. March 19th, reportedly, is the first day of spring. And reportedly, Puxatawney Phil, who believed in a ferret that lives in a hole, uh, um, reported that it was going to be an early spring. So subsequently, you probably are thinking about getting your beds ready, possibly setting up some greenhouse tents, maybe, maybe on your mind, along with thinking about some flowers or vegetables you wish to grow this year. In the beginning, the sower began to sow the first seeds, and they fell along the road, and the road was more than likely a heavily worn path or track through the fields. The falling seed might have occurred as the jars of seeds were brought out from town and the seed was transferred from the jars into seed bags so that the sowers could then sow, sow the seed. The next bunch of seeds fall, fell in rocky places. Here again, one must understand the, lands, the landscape of Jerusalem, there, where there is many rocky outcroppings throughout the arable land. Thus, as the sower cast the seed as he walked up and down the fields, there would be no surprise that some of the seeds would fall in such places. Some would have, and then some would fell into to thorns. Again, chances are uh, thorn, rows of thorns could, be, could have been used to divide up fields as well. And then lastly, of course, the seed fell on good ground. In each case, Jesus goes on to speak about how the seed acted once it was exposed to the elements, as it were, the sun, the rain, the birds. At this point, of course, the people that were hearing this parable probably were divided up into two groups, by the Holy Spirit and by their faith. For some, maybe many, they would be thinking, so this is a great rabbi everyone's making this such fuss over. If it was today, it might have been be some type of political rally that we see on TV with people selling, I got touched by Jesus t-shirts or what would Jesus do armbands. People would be coming with their sick members to receive healings or hear some great teaching or hear how Jesus had come with a great army to overthrow Rome. Instead, they hear about a farmer going out to do his work. There might have even been farmers in the crowd thinking, well, I've been a farmer all my life. My family has been farmers all their lives. 
We know all about sowing seeds. And depending on where the seed falls, causes different results. For those people, they would have listened to this parable with polite indifference at best. The second group, however, through the guidance of the Holy Spirit and their faith, their eyes would have been opened along with, it, along with their hearing to the relationship that they were actually one of the four soil types. It would have been the same Holy Spirit who revealed to the Samaritan woman by the well that Jesus was the Messiah and that the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. The one thing I like about the disciples is though they were called by Jesus, there are times when they didn't seem to be the most sharpest knife in the drawer, which of course then leaves great hope for us. Hence, the reason we see Jesus may go through and have to explain this parable to them. In fact, they, he explained most of the parables to them, to these supposedly great learned men. Jesus said, first type of seed is its ones that fall along the road. They're the ones that hear the word, but don't understand. Thus, though the seed might have been sown in their hearts, however, when the evil one comes, it is snatched up. Have there been a time in your life when you might have been reading the Bible and it seemed like just a book of interesting stories? Many say the Bible is nothing more than an ancient book of literature, similar to something like the Iliad and the Odyssey by Homer. But later, once you're born again, you're able to go back and read the same passages, but this time they feel like they're totally new stories. These are the people that may come to church because their family members drag them along and they want to appease their family members. These are the ones that come to see the show, the lights, the songs, the dancing. And they leave out grading the service one out of ten for singing, preaching, music. But they are unchanged as they were arriving as they are leaving. The next type of seeds Jesus speaks about are the ones that fall in the rocky places. The people hear the word and feel joy, maybe for the first time. They're the ones that want to be baptized the following service or want to join ten different ministry groups. However, it's not long before they're never seen again. You may pass them in the high street or at the grocery store asking, Weren't you baptized the other month? They will respond, yes, but I thought things, once I got baptized, all my troubles would go away. I would become healthy, wealthy, and wise. Well, I just got diagnosed with cancer. I have just lost my job, and I definitely don't feel any wiser. Instant bloom, instant fade, one could say. When I was ministering up at Grace Church in Hagerstown, as Pastor Bales had mentioned, I saw many examples of this. Men who would rush down to the front and accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But as Pastor Bales spoke about the other month, when such things occur, the observer doesn't truly know if there's been a heart change. For me, I would counsel these men later, and they would tell me how they felt the Spirit, and they were all happy and felt good. But a few days later, or a couple weeks later, they would be back at the same low level. A month later, they were back up front again, accepting Christ, Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior all over again. They are the ones who are, seem to be addicted to some sort of spiritual high which sadly one may see if you go to any of the mega churches or see such churches on TV. In other words, they put on a good show for the crowds. This is one of the reasons I appreciate this church, because the focus is on the Word of God. Unfortunately, 
If you go to many churches, the front of the church can tell, the, tell you a lot about how they view their worship. They may have an altar. They may have it way back, far away, and, be, and say, only if the special people can go back there. Others have turned their place into a stage and set the pulpit way over here on the side. Now, I have a, a sort of a personal connection to the National Cathedral. Uh, my uncle, who I never knew, my father's older, older brother, died in a house fire. And an image of him is up in the National Cathedral, up in one of the angels up there. And back also when my other grandfather um, was alive, he uh, was asked me to help him walk down the front steps there at the front of the National Cathedral as well. And there the pulpit is up high and off to the side. And true, it would be... I've thought about, you know, standing up there and preaching one day, that sort of thing. But then I would think, well, why am I up there? Am I up there for, the, for me, or am I up there for God and preaching? However, when you come into a church and the pulpit is what you see first, what does that tell you? That the worship is on the word of God where it needs to be. What is the focus of all of Paul's teaches and teaching to Timothy in his letters concerning what Timothy should be focusing on? Nothing but the word of God. The third bunch of seeds fell onto thorns. These are the men, Jesus says, that they hear the word. The word does take root. However, when the seeds, the, the weeds the warriors of light and deceitfulness of wealth grow up, this causes this, the word to be choked out. These are the ones that take in the word into their hearts. But as the storms of life come along, they forget what they have heard, and they go out seeking their own things. But they also forget that it was Jesus who calmed the seas, and told the seas to quiet and be settled down. It is Jesus who told Peter to get out of the boat and made Peter walk on the water. But what happened as soon as Peter stopped looking at Jesus, stopped looking at the word, he began to sink because his focus was no longer on the word, on Jesus. The fourth and final place the seeds fall is on good soil and it yielded a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100-fold. This is the man who hears the word and understands it, and indeed bear fruit. Luke 15, 5 says, But the seed in good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart, hold fast, and bear fruit with perseverance. Thus, by persevering, they were able to produce a crop. Now, there have been many times in my life where I have felt that if you looked up the, diction looked up the dictionary definition of persevering, you would find my face there. What about you and your life struggles? Could I have persevered on my own? Far from it. Could you have? I doubt it. Rather... It was an, it's an indication to you and for me that the seed has gone down, has been planted in good soil, so that when the, so now it can produce good fruit in our lives. We, in that, we must remember we are not what we ought to be, but rather we are very much different than what we used to be. Therefore, anyone in Christ, this person is a new creation. The old things have passed away, the new things have come. 
2 Corinthians 5.17. We are left then on how we're going to take this information from the 1st century to the 21st century, from the Sea of Galilee to Twinbrook, Maryland. First, one can approach the Bible with a detached curiosity. Talking with Pastor Bales the other week about this sermon, he brought up about how with Jesus' teaching in parables caused people to then ask questions. These questions were a way to begin larger conversations and where even more in-depth teachings then could occur. Secondly, this parable has been used, I believe, in many misguided ways. And in some cases, I strongly believe even in heretical teachings as well. Some have used this example of this parable as a way, as a way to show church development. If a modern-day church growth guru was to use the teaching, they might have explained how the first plan of church growth nearly didn't work. The second, well, it worked for a little while, but then sort of petered out. The third got even a better response, but then got sort of twisted up. But if you follow the last program, you should be, find your church growing by 30, 60, and 100 fold. Either way, you can buy this program for a mere $199.95 from your local church bookstore. Another way we use, the other way it is used, which I believe strongly is in a more heretical type of teaching called the prosperity gospel, where if you send money, send seed money in, it will come back to you 30, 60, and 100 fold. And if you listen to these preachers, it seems that the more zeros you put behind those 30, 60, 100 numbers, the greater return you'll receive. The question I have for you guys is this. As we've examined this parable, does it in any way talk about giving seed to the sower? No. The sower's doing just that. Sowing seeds. What is the seed but the word of God? And who gives the increase but God alone? If you let, the only way to let God into your heart, you have to open the heart, your heart door from the inside. He's not going to go kicking it down. Sure, he may permit things to happen to you that may cause you to a greater and greater need for him. Some may call these times the dark time in the soul or one's desert experience. But God's not going to kick down that door. And when you do come to the point on your knees, crying out to God, he will be there. And, he will, and with his words, they will comfort you. Why? Because simply the God, because he is a father of mercies and God of all comfort. 2 Corinthians 1.3 Now, do you have to be a preacher to sow the seed? No. Yes, God has called some to this work. However, the point is that we are all sowers to a greater or lesser degree. As Pastor brought out again in some teachings earlier in the month, we must always be ready to preach the word, to be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, extort with great patience and instruction, for the time will come when they will all not endure sound doctrine, but want to have their ears tickled. They will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and they will turn away their ears from truth and will turn aside to myths. But you, be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, Fulfill your ministry, 2 Timothy 4, 25. No, sorry, 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 5. Does that sound like an example I might have given earlier in this sermon? You're smart people. The one thing I love about you guys is actually you come with your Bibles. 
Because I'll tell you, if you're not looking at this Bible as somebody is up here teaching, you don't know what we're saying. And if it is for truth. So examine your descriptions for yourselves. Do you think those that have been in their churches have placed their focus always on, on the Bible, the Word of God, but rather have shifted their focus on putting on a good show while their congregations get their ears tickled? When there are the ones who want to at least twist doctrinal teachings for, or to, for their listenings, Sure, I could come up here and give, produce a sermon, The Seven Ways to Be a Better Father, or Ten Ways to Discipline Your Children, or even easier, come down to the front, of the, come down to the front pay your thousand dollars of seed money, and all your troubles will go away. I'll tell you something. If you believe those type teachings, I've got some great beachfront property in North Dakota to sell you. In D.K. Chesterton's book, What's wrong with the word, the world, I should say? He said, the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. Yes, Christianity is hard. The difference is when the storms of life do come and who are born again in spirit, all we need to do is tap Jesus on the shoulder, as it were, to help him calm the seas. Remember, it is he and he alone that has the power to quiet the storms of life. William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, said in the 19th century about the upcoming 20th century, the chief, the chief danger that confronts the coming century will be religion without the Holy Ghost, Christianity without Christ, Forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, politics without God, heaven without hell. So where does that leave us now in the 21st century? Because what Booth was saying about the 20th century can very easily be said about this century as well. Just this, we must all be sowers of the word in our own way. Remember what I talked about, this little slave girl, in my sermon in 2 Kings 5. Or what the Samaritan woman came to realize when he, she was sitting talking with Jesus. You may not see the increase of the seed that you sow. You may not even see the germination. But we must continue to sow the seed. Sure, there will be times when we would be thinking that we're just sowing seed along the roadside, day in and day out. Or we may be thinking we're sowing seeds into thorns. But we must sow daily through our walk, through our actions, and through our speech. We may end up harvesting what others may have sown. Jesus says this in John 4, 36 and 37. Already, the one who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the one who sows and the one who reaps may rejoice together. For in, the case, for in this case, the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap what for others you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have come into their labors. Either way, our job is to sow. The work is to study, to show ourselves approved before God, to do his work daily, picking up our bags of seed and spreading the word of God to the world. Amen.